the way that that Trump and the Republicans sold us their five trillion dollar tax cut for rich people with a, a trillion and a half of it in the first year, uh, borrowing that money from the federal treasury in our names and then passing that money out to the billionaire class in the United States, particularly those billionaires who have funded the Republican Party. Uh, you know, invest a few hundred million dollars in the, in the GOP. I think the Kochs put in, what, 600 million in the last election, maybe 400 million, whatever it was. And, you know, they probably got over a billion dollars in tax cuts. That's not a bad return on investment. You know, buying politicians now in the United States is the best investment you can make. So, you know, the billionaires buy the politicians and the politicians come out. And this, this is really started with Reagan in a big way. Reagan came out, you know, he was, he was working for, back then, you know, the, the currency was a little stronger, so they were multi-millionaires, not billionaires, or multi-hundred millionaires. But, uh, you know, basically they owned Reagan, and they owned the Republican Party at that time, and they said to Reagan, hey, let's, let's create this thing we call trickle-down economics. Now, interestingly, Warren Harding ran on this same thing in 1920 on trickle-down economics. Uh, at that time, it was called horse and sparrow economics. Because in 1910, most people rode horses. They didn't drive cars, right? And uh, everybody who rode a horse, owned a horse, knew that horses eat oats. Their digestive systems are not 100% efficient. And so horse poop, horse patties, uh, the sparrows love to go peck through them looking for seeds, for, you know, undigested bits of oat that the sparrows can eat. And so literally the exact same economic philosophy that Ronald Reagan rolled out as brand new discovery in 1981 was what Warren Harding, or in 1980 when he was running for president, was what Warren Harding ran for president on in 1920, the horse and sparrows theory, that if we feed more oats to the horses, there will be more poop for the sparrows. And so, you know, in other words, put money in at the top, cut taxes, Warren Harding, 1920, ran on the whole idea. You cut the top tax rate from 95%, which is where it was in 1920, down to 25%, which is where it was by 1922. Cut that top tax rate down. And as a consequence of that, uh, you know, the sparrows are going to get rich, or the sparrows are going to get a lot more food, and, uh, you know, who cares that the horses are getting really, really big. So, you know, Reagan just said, you know, it'll just trickle down. You know, if, if it all trickles down, then, you know, we, well, I say we produce a nation of peons, you know, it should be called a golden shower. But in any case, this was the, philo the philosophy that they were trying to sell. And uh, so GM comes out. And they said, so this is from their, from their uh, most recent press release or, or news release or whatever it is, where they were announcing that they were going to lay off 14,000 people and shut seven factories in North America. And, of course, they're, they're moving that manufacturing to Mexico. With changing customer preferences in the U.S. and in response to market-related volume declines in cars, future products will be allocated to fewer plants next year. Now, what they're saying is that they're responding to weakening demand in the small and mid-size mid car business, uh, as David uh, Akajian points out over at Daily Kos. And, and, you know, they're basically just explaining supply and demand. You know, it, it is not giving money to rich people that builds an economy. What giving money to rich people does is it exacerbates inequality. It, it makes the rich richer and it makes working class people poorer. That's all it does. The horse and sparrow theory was shall we say horse poop, and so was trickle down. But the Republicans are still trying to sell trickle down. But have you noticed that in GM's announcement that they're going to build a new factory in Mexico and they're going to shut down seven factories in the United States, there's no mention of tax cuts. Yeah, we got a couple hundred million dollars from the tax cut. Thank you very much. We bought back our own stock with it thus jacking the pay of our senior executives, as Sherrod Brown pointed out on this program last week. You've got, you've got uh, you know, four senior executives at GM who took like millions and millions of dollars out of that tax cut. And you know, a lot of the senior executives and, and stockholders are just you know, making a fortune on it. So the bottom line is it's not 
you know, taxes don't create demand. Taxes, you know, cutting taxes doesn't stimulate an economy unless you're cutting the taxes of people at the very bottom. And the fact of the matter is that about a third of all American workers are really not paying income taxes. They're, you know, they're not making enough money to pay income taxes. They're, they're paying, uh, uh, they're, they're, they're paying several taxes at the top. They're paying, they're paying taxes at the top, but, uh, excuse me, they're paying taxes for Social Security and Medicare, but they are not paying taxes at all, <laughs> you know, in income taxes. So you got, you know, part of Obama's stimulus package was to cut the Social Security tax for either one or two years. And that actually boosted the economy immediately because all of a sudden people at the bottom of the pay scale who spend 100% of their income had 2% more income. But that's the only way you can use taxes to stimulate an economy in, in a way that is meaningful, lasting, and grows the economy. In fact, if you go back to 1944, this is David Leonhardt, a great piece in uh, yesterday's New York Times, American Capitalism Isn't Working. And he points out the October 1944 edition of Fortune magazine. Now, this is just before the war is over. Just before the war is over. And William B. Benton, he, he uh, founded uh, Benton and Bowles, which is a major ad agency in the United States throughout the middle of the 20th century. And, you know, keep in mind, we had just experienced 15 years of depression and war. And Americans were worried that if the war, when the war ended, that we'd go back into the depression. Because the war was this enormous economic stimulus. I mean, you know, the federal government was pouring hundreds of, in today's dollars, Billion, hundreds of billions of dollars into war material. And when I think it was about 700,000 men came home from, from World War II at the end of the war, and uh, you know, there was concern that they would just be unemployed, the unemployment rate would jack back up and we'd be thrown back into a depression. So Benton writes, today victory is our purpose. Tomorrow our goal will be jobs, peacetime production, high living standards, and opportunity. And in fact, that's what they did, as Leonhardt points out. CEO took, CEOs took pay packages that, you know, they were making 10, 15, 20, at the most 30 times what their employees were making. Which you know, today, you know, when CEOs are making 10,000 times what their employees are making, it just seems like, whoa, they did that, really? Yeah, they did that for the better part of 50 years, 40 years. Middle, and, and the result of this was that middle class income rose because the people at the top, by the way, one of the reasons why they were taking low, low pay packages was because after they made about the equivalent of $3 million in today's dollars, their top tax rate went up to 95%, and, and, or 91%, I guess it was. And the result of that was that throughout the 1950s and 1960s, and even the very early 1970s, the wages, the income, and the wealth of average working people was increasing faster than the top 1%. I mean, they, they were all going up, but the middle was growing the fastest. In other words, income inequality was actually declining as a result of that high tax rate. And the economy boomed. I mean, it just absolutely boomed. And then came Reaganomics. The only people you should worry about are the stockholders. Forget about the community. Forget about the, you know, uh, the, the customer. Forget about your impact on, on, the, on the nation. Forget, forget about your responsibility to the institution of the company itself. You can collapse it. You can sell it. You can, you can you know, suck it dry. Doesn't matter. Just maximize the value for your shareholders, the investor class, the millionaires and billionaires. That's, that's your only job. And to do that, you need to, you need to lobby for deregulation, you need to cut taxes, you need to have a union-free workplace, and you have to reduce wages and keep that minimum wage as low as you possibly can. And, you know, that, that was Reaganomics. And since 1979 to today, median weekly earnings have grown a miserly one-tenth of one percent a year. And in fact, uh, you know, American, uh, the, 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 Leonhardt writes, the typical American family today has a lower net worth than the typical family did 20 years ago. Life expectancy, shockingly, has fallen in this last decade. We are in the 40-something year of Reaganomics, right? 
89 oh, it's uh, 38 years, 37 years of Reaganomics. And it has devastated the middle class, the working class in the United States. And it continues to devastate our economy. This is the Tom Hartman Program.